First, I want to say thank you to the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies. Uh, it's a great nonprofit that's been doing great work for as long as I've been aware of them. And I, I was in Colorado for about 12 years, so I've been aware of them for a while. So I want to thank Jody and Annie for, for giving us the opportunity, everyone, the team there. Uh, I'm John Dean. I'm a speech language pathologist. I specialize in Parkinson's, and I'm joined here by Josefa Domingos, a physiotherapist that also specializes in Parkinson's. And we focus on what's called dual task exercise that's combining movement and voice and cognition. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today and how we build it into a range of different exercise programs. And throughout the rest of this series, we're actually going to demonstrate with different types of exercise how to incorporate it in there and let you try all the different programs. So I hope that um, everyone has had lunch. Yes? No. <laughs> No, oh no. We're in California. <laughs> oh, you get some time then. Because then if we've been a, if we're gonna be looking at pizzas, oh no, everyone will be hungry, right? At the end. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think uh, first of all, just explain this idea of having the pizza. So it's not about diet, but the idea would be for us to create an uh, something would that would allow I would say a tool that will help you memorize. Uh, the messages that we're going to pass. And so tomorrow when you go to the gym, you're going to look at what you're doing in terms of your exercise and think, do I have a complete pizza? So that's our goal. The pizza will help you remember the tools and stuff that, that we go, that we think about in exercise. At this moment, we have so many choices of things that we can put on our exercise pizza. You all agree? So I want to give you some examples. So imagine we have the dance where people can choose from. We have the Qigong. We have the speech, we have the treadmill, like in the gym, all the exercise tools, Tai Chi, boxing, yoga, the Lisa one big, the big, the amplitude, the power moves. So all those specific programs of Parkinson. We have the strength training that people do also at the gym. And then we have everything with the ball, right? Ping pong, pickleball, walking football. So the way we look at, at exercise at this moment, we think we have a new problem, which is a good problem. We have so many options. And so now what we probably need to do is to help guide people into how do I decide what to do and how do I join? When do I do one thing? When do I do another? How do I combine this? So if this makes sense to you, this is why the idea of the pizza is like, how do I combine it so I can make a pizza that's really good for me, that will work for me, right? I think the next challenge will be, okay, can I actually have a pizza that is... Um, good for me as well as being effective and I say this because you will often hear someone say like do the exercise that you like this is something that is very projected and often heard it's like an old joke you hear like what's the best exercise for Parkinson's and the punchline is like whichever one you'll do yeah so that sentence makes sense if we compare it to nothing if you will agree you'll see that if someone is lacking the motivation to do exercise then anything that the person likes and is able to do, then yes, in that situation, the person should do what they like. Ideally, we will create exercises that are, have both, that are also beneficial and fun and enjoyable at the same time. We are getting there. I think more and more programs are thinking about this and thinking about how much the enjoyment is a key element. But sometimes we are doing exercises that maybe we don't like so much because we have a specific problem, right? So it's getting to the point where we think about, is it, should I just do whatever I like? But at the same time, think about all the research that's going into this area. And if we are dedicating so much time and money and resources and resources to giving you best information, then it makes sense for us to think about, okay, what is the evidence telling us? So we have to be able to combine it. And this makes it sometimes even more confusing. So what we decided to think about is like, how can we put this in a very practical way so that we can guide people's choices. And what we thought about was, okay, so let's think about our pizza and we think about what are the essential ingredients that we really need to have an exercise program? What are general ingredients that everyone talks about? And then of course, how can I have some elements of, you know, something that is my personal taste that I like? Because if I like to dance and somebody tells me I have to go do boxing, how do we deal with this issue? Huh? But I really like to dance, why can't I dance, right? What we wanna do with this pizza exercise is to help you transform whatever exercise you do 
into something that's more specific to help you keep well with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so that's that's the main idea through here. And let's start off by the essential ingredients. I would say, think, let's think about the things that specifically, that are very specific to Parkinson's disease. And one of them is the small movement, the slow movement, right? The other one is the, the slow movement that I say. So we have small movements, we have slower movements. So when we think about solutions, we're going to have to have this in, into account, right? Then we have what? We also have the what they, uh, the scientists used to say, fatigability. I don't know if I said that right, but it's a very long word, which means when you are usually assessed by a neurologist, they might do exercises like this or like this. It's not exercises, sorry, it's a test. And what they are assessing when they're asking you to do this is if you are able to keep the movement big, if you are able to keep it fast, so that's where the slowness comes in, and then if you do this repeatedly, what happens is the movement might break down. So that's where the fatigue comes in and you break down the rhythm and pauses. Right, that's a really important concept because we talk about in the medical term, they talk about bradykinesia, that slow movement. But a lot of times when you start it, the movement can be perfectly good and then it's over time or maybe while something's distracting you while duplex capping, then it gets smaller and slower and then the, the breaks down. And that's, that's yeah. really much more characteristic than always slow. So these are when, you do these movements or these movements, the neurologist is assessing this bradykinesia, the slowness of movement, which has these three ingredients in it. This is what he's looking for, right? And this is important as I said, okay, so that's the baseline. That's really what's what's pinpointing there in, in Parkinson. If you imagine you just got diagnosed, the doctor asks, asks you to do this with your hands and there's no difference. And he, so he asks you to do this at the same time that he's assessing your rigidity, right? So we know that there is a direct influence when you are doing two things at once. This is what usually slows us down, is when we're alternating our attention from one thing to the other. And this is where the cognition is also an essential ingredient. Everything basically that we do comes from, obviously in terms of our, an order from up above, right? What is another ingredient? Something that maybe people are talking about more now, because initially when we started working Parkinson these non-motor issues, apathy, depression. So we do have these mood changes that will also obviously influence the, the basis of how people do activity and do exercise. If we are feeling depressed, if we don't, if we are feeling indifferent uh, or sad or anxious, our mood towards doing exercise is completely changed, right? Our motivation is compromised. So now we think, okay, so this is what the core elements that I would say that things that happen in Parkinson and what are we going to do about it? What, how are we going to fight against this? So by logic, we have small movements. So you will hear a lot of the therapists talk about amplitude. It's like the key word, do everything big, right? So this is in exercise, whatever you're doing, everyone's saying big, big. Or loud from the speech component <laughs> of that. It's the <laughs> same thing. Loud. <laughs> yes, it came from loud. <laughs> Then we think about, okay, so once you do it nice and big, they start pushing you and so the effort, right? So it's the bigness and then doing it faster. So the speed is also an element that I, I think sometimes in exercise is kind of lost because what happens when we do it fast? Once you start doing it fast, the movement starts getting smaller. So there is a compromise, right? So we have to find ways to be able to train that bigness and to cue you to always keep that amplitude. And that's challenging because we can't do fast movements and big all the time, right? So there is, we know that there has to be an adaptation so that you can get the rhythm back. And rhythm is about that, right? Me being able to get the right amplitude at the right speed so that I can actually do the movement. And so when we think about when I join amplitude and speed and I start doing a movement like this, obviously what we are talking about repetitive movement, which will bring on an aerobic component of exercise. And aerobic means that I am increasing my heart rate as I'm doing the exercise. And this is one that you will hear also often about the relevance. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, talking about exercise is something that has become very common, which is great. It's great to see how much this has changed. And so it's just these key words, aerobic exercise is very strong in Parkinson's disease. It's really the focus. What about cognition? So we have, okay, we have to think about how can we add in these cognitive challenges and what exactly are we talking about in cognition? And we'll come back to that in a second. 
for the mood? How can we fight against these changes, this feeling sadness? We can only fight this if people are highly engaged in their exercise in terms of enjoying. So if the people, if people are having fun, that means that they are able to endure longer the activity and more importantly, ongoing, because it's not about doing a program for four times a week for one month. It's about motivating people ongoing and going through crisis in the disease as well, where we want to be able to, even in those moments of crisis, keep people moving. Right? Yeah, it's funny, uh, culturally speaking, Colorado has more people who are highly motivated to exercise than anywhere I've ever been in my life. And it's no problem getting people with Parkinson's to, to eat their Wheaties or the broccoli or whatever. But, um, and that's great and that's important and I'm not fighting against that. But boy, once you make it into something that's engaging and people are interacting, all of a sudden it's kind of the best of both worlds. And over in Portugal, it's a lot less of that kind of culture. So it always <laughs> has to be fun. So there's a kind of nice happy medium, I think, in there. And I think by making it, gamifying it a little bit, you really get the kind of best of both worlds. I say I usually work with people that are highly depressed and um, and have no habits of exercise. So I, it's a challenge to keep people motivated. It's been my life's work. <laughs> and that, that's a Portuguese trait, she's yes. saying, really, yes. And, and cakes. cakes. And I'm always amazed to see someone in the States saying, oh. doing so much. It's First beautiful. time you came to Colorado, it blew your mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if we think about, yeah. we want a way for people to remember these ingredients, right? So it's not all theory. Let's associate that our crust of our pizza will mean something that you hear the main ingredient, right? Which is the amplitude. So if we if we have like your exercise in your mind, this is the exercise that I do, whatever exercise you do, does it contemplate me training amplitude? If we add in another ingredient, which would be the tomato, and I say there is absolutely no pizza without the crust and without the tomato and without the cheese, right? So if we add in our speed as a memory is our tomato of our pizza, does it also include or progress to having speed? It doesn't have to be immediate speed, it has to progress to it. And of course, when we combine these two, as I mentioned before, that really works on, uh, on you feeling less fatigued and being able to endure more activities and give you that rhythm back. So let's think about, okay, so when we thought about what is the next ingredient that we need and the next ingredient that we thought is, okay, so what cheese? These are the three names. So we have a, a pizza that eh, doesn't, it wouldn't be the best pizza in the world, but it's a pizza. So we have the crust, we have the tomato, we have the cheese, right? And the cognition really has to be represented here as the cheese because it is the basis of any activity that we do. So it's now figuring out, okay, cognition is a very strong word and uh, it, it frightens people, right? It's like, I don't want to forget who I am. No, that's not what we're talking about. We, it's very important for us to be able to uh, have these educational programs and to help people understand that it's specific cognitive skills that are more compromised due to this uh, interference of doing dual tasks and uh, doing activities in daily life, like walking and talking. When we think about these activities, the attention, being able to divide your attention, it affects your automatic pilot. So the things that were normal that no one thinks about, which is when you're walking, no one's thinking about putting your one foot in front of the other. If you don't have Parkinson's, you're not thinking about that. That's automatically done. And now suddenly you have to think about that because when you don't think about that and you're doing something else, then your feet start to drag, right? So it's this influence, it's those things that were lost that, that were automatic and now are more compromised because of the, the dopamine, the lack of dopamine. And that means that now you have to think about your posture when you're talking with someone, because if you were engaged in the conversation, then your posture might become less, less good, right? I remember someone tell me a, a story a long time ago about they used to go on a walk with their wife and then they'd start talking to get into it and he would get slower and slower and he wouldn't keep up every time. And it's just, it was just the engagement of the conversation meant the focus was there. And again, as you were saying, it's the autopilot. It's the, it's the cruise control is what's being in the basal ganglia is what's being impaired. And uh, that walking and talking to me, that's the original dual task. We've been doing that dual task for thousands of years. Yeah. So I think what uh, it's like highlighting, for example, uh, activities like planning. If we are, remember, slow, slowness 
is is the key element so it's it also will means that when i'm planning something i might be slower when i'm doing it i get to the kitchen and i forget what i was going to do or i see something there and i said oh let me do this before i forget so these things are the challenges that mainly people report but and it has to do with specific uh, cognition so i know this is a, a, a subject that people are afraid of of touching so much like am i going to really have severe cognitive issues. It's like knowing that these are the challenges and how can we fight them? How can we integrate that into exercise so it makes you better? Mm -hmm. And this was just to highlight really this importance of cognition that we've been touching upon. The one that's most well known is really the, 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 the effect on walking. This is where the first, these research studies came out was how uh, being able to walk and talk at the same time and the gait pattern was changing but people would notice that their legs start to drag and sometimes it's it's i wouldn't say sometimes mostly it is perceived by the family and the person might not notice again because it's it's your automatic you're not thinking about it and so it might be uh, the family member that says oh he's dragging his feet more or tells the person you're not moving your arm when you're walking so these sometimes are even the first signs that take people to the neurologist because there's something wrong with your walking because you're not moving your arm yeah. The relevance of this is, again, related to uh, the situation of risks of falls, and this is one of the concerns, is that when we take quick decisions, we might hesitate, and that might break down the movement, as you see, and so taking those quick decisions may, may place you more at risk. When we think about factors, one of the main factors that influence falling in Parkinson, it's it's really this decision making moments uh, in daily activities. And besides the effect it actually has on movement, it also has effect on thinking. So sometimes if I if I have someone that has balance difficulties and I am talking with that person in the standing position, that person might have more difficulty answering me. Something that we are discussing. So it's it, finding it harder to find the word uh, to, to, to focus on what I'm saying. But if I sit that person down, then the person's cognition improves, right? So it's just there is a direct influence. And sometimes these tricks are very important for, for the person and for the family members to know so that you can use it accordingly, right? Now, imagine if I have someone that's more sleepy, so it might have sleep attacks during the day and I want to engage in a conversation. If I sit with that person in a nice, comfortable couch, the probability of that person falling asleep is much bigger. So, which means in that case, maybe the strategy would be, let's stand up so I can really tell you this, this is important that you have to hear. Right. There's an interesting body of research that shows that uh, posture has a huge influence on, on cognition and, and mm -hmm. alertness levels. And some of that seems fairly intuitive, uh, but it even affects the neurotransmitters associated with alertness and stress and that, that's why uh, having a good posture and not getting in too too comfortable position can be valuable how can this be translated to exercise because our goal was to talk about exercise and so it's like is it possible for us to be able to put these things into an exercise does it make sense how can i train all these things in an exercise and we want to give you a little example let's see maybe the sound Oops, let me write down. Lower it down. Now I'm going to lower the sound so that we can explain. So basically, what we have is they are listening to a beat so that helps us facilitate movement and random numbers are being set and according to the random number they have certain instructions so if they hear the number five they lift up their hands if they hear an odd number they go backwards if they hear an even number they go forward right so there's a motor action according to the cognitive prompt that they're receiving and i think what's important is like how can we make these exercises fun so i think my best assessment is to see if people are smiling. I think we have some smilers here. That's a new word I just made up. And then we engage in people like in playfulness, I think is important because it's okay to play when we exercise because as long as you are doing what you are supposed to do there, 
the goal is what we have an aerobic component so they are working out they are engaged they have they are moving forward they are using something relevant which is the walking as well then we find ways to to create to increase the the complexity where someone is being asked to be um i would say intruder that's what's happening now it's so he's, <laughs> he's doing he's doing the wrong answers to see if everyone is following or if they're actually thinking for themselves right so this was just just an idea that uh, we just wanted to share with you that it is possible to put it together and many therapists are thinking about this at this moment and they're trying to engage all these components in a fun way if we think about okay so what would be inside these general ingredients and the general ingredients, I, uh, we decided that it would be what you are hearing often. I'm, I assume you have heard a lot of talks about exercise, and this has been the most recent uh, exercise guidelines. So you're probably hearing a lot about these are the four components that should be in your week of exercise. There should be some sort of aerobic exercise where your heart rate is increased. And this one is actually in red on purpose because it is the most important one. And we have specific recommendations that people should do it three times a week, at least 30 minutes. So these, I think, are messages that I, I assume that everyone uh, is familiar with. So I won't go into more detail. But we have the strength. We have the balance and the agility and the dual tasking made it to the guidelines now because we start understanding that cognition influences balance. We know this already from strong research, and now we just need to figure out how to get stronger research for how does the training uh, also affect and give us results. So the dual task training by, uh, per se. Now I can share what most uh, therapists will be thinking about when we create an exercise in the clinic is how can we mimic that problem that the person is having at home, right? So the person says, I'm, have, I'm struggling getting out of the couch. We will go through a whole checklist of things, thinking about, okay, uh, is it, do you have, do you struggle when you're going to do something else, like the door bell rings and the person tries to get up quickly and then falls back? Is it when you're talking with someone? Uh, is it when you're alone? Uh, what type of couch do you have? So there's several things that we think about, but when we are going to think about an exercise, we're probably going to include a couch or a very soft uh, chair in the gym so that we can train that and then add in those distracting factors that, that would be a normal exercise to include uh, the dual tasking okay so let's include this into our pizza we have our amplitude we have our amplitude our crust we have our tomato our speed we have our cheese our cognition and the aerobics associated and now let's include these okay so no, I'm not going to, you don't have to remember the mushrooms and everything else regarding. I'm just glad there's no pineapple on there. <laughs> it's just the crust that it's made of and the, the, the cheese for me would be all good. And then we have, so we have these ones that we just talked about. We talked about the balance, we talked about the strength, we talked about the flexibility. And we'll go into detail how important each one of them because they have different importance. And we mentioned how important it is for the enjoyment. What do we put? In our pizza that makes it so special that it's that one that you always choose we will add an ingredient as a challenge which would be our voice given there's also obviously changes in parkinson related yeah and i think this is really um is really one of the key factors that i think i won't say it's a differentiator but it's the first thing that i noticed when i started working with people who had parkinson's for doing all these dual tasks and speech to me is is such a key component and such an easy way to put it in there and when we started working together we noticed pretty quickly that it's also a great way to understand if people are are getting it or doing the exercise so the first question becomes whether or not um this is it's something that you add to the exercise pizza you know is it another ingredient or is it its own pizza it's its own set of exercises and i think the answer is both you know it's yes because we certainly focus on making sure that we have voice involved in all the exercises and it becomes especially in, in in virtual classes it becomes a very good way to understand how well people are performing but there are great reasons to work on a separate voice activity and we'll be doing that actually on uh, in just a couple of weeks on the 16th to do exercises that are more voice forward voice centric and you'll see the benefits of both we we do them in classes but you can certainly work on them separately i think it's something that people are, are 
probably used to in terms of uh, Parkinson specific exercises that I'm sure people are doing. You're counting one, two, three, or four, or five for the alphabet, right? So you're using your voice engaging. So it does seem to be a good element to add on. Yeah, and you know, honestly, where where, where a lot of this comes from is too was originally the voice, the Lisa Wren voice therapy. So it, it, a lot of the amplitude approaches come out of that. Um, but that's only one factor. When you start looking at all the aspects, loudness is probably the one we're most familiar with. If you've worked with a speech therapist, a speech language pathologist, you probably did either LSVT or Speak Out, and those are programs that are amplitude focused. So, you know, just like you move with bigger movements, you talk with a louder voice. But other things that can be improved and are impacted by Parkinson's are the pitch and the prosody, the music of it, you know, going up when you ask a question and walking through the, the prosody of one item and then there's another item and then there's a third item. And the way I say that, you know that I'm done when I said third item. Uh, speed is a big issue. Um, sometimes it can be too fast. It can be like when you have someone walking in there and they're moving with too fast the speed, uh, too fast the steps, you can do that with your speech or it can be the opposite, or you can actually have stuttering. So these are all things that we can work into the exercises to practice it. And then aside from the speech components, the movement of the lips and the teeth and the tongue and the voice and all that stuff, then you have all the cognition that comes in with the, with the language. So that's your attention and your memory and your turn taking. Verbal fluency is just a fancy way of talking about word finding. And it's one of the most common things it's, it's like if I had someone who came in uh, to my clinic and they were like, oh, I have a diagnosis of Parkinson's and they, they didn't have a quiet voice in a little bit and then their sleeping wasn't impaired, I'd be like, oh, that's not normal. And then if they didn't tell me they had that tip of the tongue problem, I'd be like, wait a second. <laughs> it's so common and it's common in, in adults anyways, but it's more so in Parkinson's. So these are the things that we can add in. And as you see us doing the exercise programs throughout the course of this two month series, you'll see us putting different components in here. We'll be using the prosody in a kind of a gamified way or the loudness or the fluency. And I, I think this detail, you know, as a physiotherapist and integrating voice, knowing that there's much more than just telling people to, to talk loud, makes me feel the responsibility of when the person is concerned about their voices to actually, you know, try to think about a different pizza, which would be going and, and to see a speech therapist, right? So it, I think there's moments, there's different moments where we might need something different, more or not, according to the problem that we want to fight against, right? Good point, yeah. Like how do we combine these specifically for the problem that I was saying? I think because your choices will always be, uh, yes, I wanna do something that I like, but I also want to solve my the, the challenges that Parkinson is bringing you. Right. I mean, that's why that's what motivates most people to do exercise is because they know that it's doing it for their health. So we really want to focus on it is this problem that I want. So if you imagine I want to improve my walking and we know that there's enough research to support that the best thing that you can do is walk on a treadmill because just research did more did more studies with people doing uh, walking on a treadmill. Right. But that doesn't mean that walking outdoors won't give you benefit. So it's like there's different options that might get you to the same goal. And that has to be, how do I make sense of this? How do you make sense of this? Obviously, don't feel the pressure of, I have to know all this because there's health professionals that guide you on this. This is why we exist. What's important to, message to, to pause here is that not everything is at the same level of evidence, which means if I have two hours that I can give to doing exercise through the week, then I should really focus on choosing something that will really help me for my Parkinson, right? So I have to be selective. So no, I can't do every single day uh, flexibility, three times a week balance, three times a week strength, three times a week aerobic exercise. It's not compatible with life. I, even though most people are retired and they do find it fun to go to the gym, that's what they usually do when they go, they combine several of these ingredients, right? And if you have to choose, I think it's our responsibility to share with you, they are not at the same level of, it, of evidence, which means we know, for example, that the aerobic component, aerobic exercises, for example, the dancing, the boxing, the walking, the running, those type of exercises are the ones that will probably have more influence on 
keeping you well in terms of progression of the disease. If nothing else, right, that. When I say nothing else, it's like you want to specifically improve your walking, so you might consider an activity that actually trains your walking in an aerobic way. Right? Some of the strongest exercise uh, evidence for aerobic uh, activity comes from the University of Colorado in conjunction with some other ones. That's the SPARK study. I, I know that a couple of you have actually uh, participated in it because it was done at the University of Colorado. It's now into the third uh, session of the SPARKS 3, but that's the data of aerobic efficacy uh, is, is in, in indisputable at this point, and a lot of it was done locally for you guys. Yeah, and I think uh, we added in also the community-based training. So it's the community-based programs, the Parkinson-specific programs that the associations are delivering. So there you can get a little bit of every single ingredient, but you can also look at what you are doing and have more knowledge on, maybe I should focus a little bit more on this on that. Okay? That's, that's the goal. And I would I just highlight here the, the flexibility training, so stretching. When we do amplitude and those big movements that people talk about, the power moves, you are in, in a, engaging with the bradyca you are affecting the bradycinesia, the, the slowness of movement and the rigidity. It was one of the programs that showed benefit over these two elements. Remember the core elements? So that means that you will probably get more uh, relief of rigidity if you do slow amplitude movement than when we compare it to flexibility. So that's why it's low here, because most of the time it's more, the stretching is something that is used in studies as a control group that we're not expecting results. So just keep mindful of that. Don't spend like, okay, I'm gonna, you know what I really love? I like to do stretching three times a week and I'm not gonna do anything else. And I'm going to call that my exercise. That's my alert. Okay, so that's it's like um, helping you understand that the aerobic component is really important, and that for your symptoms there are other things that might help you also more. Now let me give you an example. So what are people doing at this moment? They are trying to compare the different exercises so that we can see what the what would I choose for specific outcomes. For example. In this uh, research study, they compared all these 10 different activities and what they saw was the dance had most benefit over balance. So imagine, okay, if I had to choose between one of these and I'm, and I'm struggling with my balance, oh, isn't that funny? Dance actually got the best results. It also got the best results for influencing motor function in Parkinson's. So the assessment scales that we use, which is the Movement Disorder Society Unified Rating Scale. It's those tests that the neurologist will do to see if your disease is progressing or not. So he monitors that when he does those tests. Just real it, quick, movement, motor means movements. When she's doing, when your doctor, she's going through that test, that's that's what she's talking about there. Yeah, yeah. So those, it showed usually when we do a good research study like medication if it had effect over this scale which is the relevance the clinical relevance of any research study if it can prove benefit over there and for, curious enough hearing this comparison the dance was better than all compared to the rest now let's see there's a lot of mixture here right because you see you know tai chi compared to aquatic training one is much more aerobic than the other right so sometimes these the personal factors that we need to also weigh here it's like what if i don't like water how can i get the aerobic exercise in something that i do like and that's why it's not possible to to eliminate this and these personal factors it's like it's you it's your context it's your resources all have to play a, a role in what you can access as exercise as well it shouldn't be. I think people should always have access to, to the best that we have, but unfortunately the world is it functions like that. We're getting better. I think I think we've we've found new ways to get the expertise out to more people. And I feel like now if you have something you want to try, you should be able to find someone somewhere to be able to help you with that. So yes, it's it's not perfect yet, but it's getting better, I think. So we have to find solutions for questions like this, right? So it's like, have you ever tried a workout? trend everyone says for example boxing very popular you should try the boxing it changed my life i love the boxing 
but then you go and you do not like it because maybe you don't like fighting. I've heard this once. I've heard that more than once, yeah. So it's in, it's not according to your personality. And it's like, can we have other options? So I think the responsibility of society is to create other options that are complete as well. Uh, what people enjoy a lot in the boxing, obviously, is the the camaraderie. See if I said it right? Yeah, the camaraderie, <laughs> yeah, the, the connection with everybody. Which, not, the, not the part where you're punching, but which, the, the other connection. Yeah, which, which I would say is probably transversal to any program. The strongest, the glue, what makes people come back to these programs is the friendships that are grown in these activities. So I think we might come to the conclusion that it's not even about the activity, but it's about the, the social cognition and the social connection that people have in these groups. But again, as long as we have those core ingredients, which is the aerobic, right? The amplitude and the speed. Yeah, the basics of, of a yeah. pizza. So we start if we think, okay, how can I, what is my, if I'm struggling to, to exercise, how do I know what I like? No. So thinking about what is the, my favorite way to exercise is a question you can ask yourself. What keeps me motivated to exercise? I wake up in the morning and what takes me out of bed to exercise is because I'm going to do this program and my friends are going to be there. So it's just something that I like to do alone. I like to do with groups. And then a question that we haven't approached a lot. When I say we, I say the community, which is guiding people. When should I change? Should I always, if I'm always in a boxing class, uh, when should, should I change? Should there be diversity in my exercises? Let's guide on somebody saying, well, I don't know what I like. Um, and if I don't know, then you might have to ref reflect more on things like, um, have I done something before that I really enjoyed? And why did I enjoy it? Was it because of the music? Was it because of the people? So challenging ourselves out of our comfort zone is important so that we challenge the brain. And I know everyone is fighting to stay the best they can against the progression of the disease. And so being open mind to try different things, I think it's important for you to have that different um, cognitive challenge. Uh, we do wanna highlight two important factors. I put, I put them as additional ingredients, but I would say, if we're talking about something specific to Parkinson, then we have enough knowledge to guarantee that it is efficacious. It's a complex word. Efficacy means that it does what it's supposed to do. So I do an intervention because I know it will benefit me. And at the same time, it has to be equally balanced on safety. So these are the two elements that are critical in any activity that you do. And if you are if you are working with professionals, uh, they will have this in consideration. They are always looking to give you what works best and keeps you safe as well. So we know that there's a lot of modern um, technology that's been used, and this is just an example of someone that is uh, 43 years old with Parkinson for eight years, and so she really needs to do something that's highly engaging and fun. And so we're using this, the technology, sometimes people use the Wii at home uh, or the, the video games uh, to do exercise. And here we actually considered, uh, considering that she's in a safe environment. So we're actually using a trampoline and she's doing activity. You have all the ingredients, you have the cognition, you have the, the aerobic exercise, you have the, but you can see my concern there. I am continuously correcting her from overusing her less affected side. So because there is an asymmetry in Parkinson, there is always one, hand, one, one, one side of the body that is more affected than the other. As you can see, in this case, it's the left. So she's so focused on the exercise, on do, doing perfect, perfectly the movement, the cognition, so that I'm trying to call her attention about the hands and the arms, and I'm struggling. So that's why I'm laughing, because I'm trying to push up both hands, both hands. Yeah. Like you can even see the avatar should show you that like the right hand's not coming up as much. And so I'm, I'm like, I have to go in, I have to correct continuously. And it would seem like a very harmful, harmless activity, right? Trampoline, nothing can happen. Person, Remember, she, she's young onset, so it's, of course, that's why we're using something more radical. But this goes for any exercise that you do. 
sometimes when we are doing exercise, we might not be mindful that there's compensations happening. So having that guidance sometimes helps. Okay. So what we thought about is like, let's get a practical example to see if it, if this tool of the pizza actually works out for us and makes sense to you all. And so we're going to grab on to the one that has the best evidence. And the best evidence goes for dance. Uh, the, the most well-known program that people associate to Parkinson is Dance for PD. But there are several types of dances that have been targeted as research. We are coming to the conclusion that it might not be about the dance, but it might be about the activity itself, the aerobic component that's showing the benefits. But one thing, so let's put this one on and see, we have the Irish dancing. So I, I usually think of dance as, you know, you can either use it as leisure. So imagine I, uh, you have like uh, country uh, dancing. I don't know what is the most specific dance in Colorado. Line, yeah. Line dancing. Go to the Grizzly Rose. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you can have, you, can lo you go to a local place that doesn't even have to have people with Parkinson and you are doing exercise. And this is for leisure, right? So we're doing mm. something. What components could we have here that are absolutely guaranteed? Guaranteed in dance would be the aerobic component and the enjoyment. That's why people do it because they like it, right? And people are able to. Uh, I would. In, I have some patients that say, I, sp I spend the whole afternoon dancing at at the at the bar. It's not bar, but yeah. So the ongoing component, the aerobic component, is is really great. It's very strong. So if we compare to remember, if we compare to nothing, everything is good. But now it's like, can we make this, can we use this tool, this dance that everyone enjoys and make it even more specific to Parkinson? So our question is, as therapists always has to be, can we improve and use what works and just add on the ingredients that we need for Parkinson, right? This will be one of the programs that we do. I can go over the sound a little bit. Okay, I was keeping the music because yeah. so you can see that the music is slightly different. It is more boom, boom, so it cues you better. What you can see in this, if you if I don't have the music, it's almost like we're doing the big movements like the power moves, right? But with with the music, it's completely different. So it's we are reinforcing the same movements, but we're just dancing it with, with sound. There it's important to hear our Enrique Iglesias, right, contigo, because it's a cue for that movement or else it's, it would be out of place, right? Um, so so this is just to show, okay, do we have the amplitude here? Yes. Do we have the speed? Yes. Do we have the cognition? Yes, because we're changing the exercises continuously. We can create also a routine and people have to memorize. We, we have the aerobic, we have the enjoyment. What happens in these exercise classes? We also adapt things so that we have some strength when we're squatting down and we're going lower. So there is always a component of strength, balance for sure. As long as you're moving in space, you, you're training your balance, right? And then at flexibility would be, again, reinforcing that by doing these movements, we are focusing on reducing the rigidity through that. So I think this would be a good example. Now, jumping on to, would this be valid like online? Do we have the same thing? the same activity would it be the same most people say oh no i prefer to do in person everyone says right uh, but it's it's our belief that if the person is highly engaged if you are engaged that means you're enjoying yourself that means you're learning that means you you are using all the, the cognitive resources and emotion in the same activity so there's no reason to believe that it would be different but we don't have the evidence yet for that right it's coming out but this is possible, and so this is also just an example. I should have had the people with Parkinson, though. Again, yeah. this will be one of the programs that we do in this series, will be a Zumba Gold class. Good. So just to, to quickly show that if we have the person engaged, 
what online makes most sense for me is people having difficulty to get to the gym, right? People having difficulty to get out of the house or something happened and you can't go on that day and you have and you have something that you can do. Uh, so it's I think it just serves. It's a different format to deliver uh, the same thing. So hopefully people can use that wisely according to to those needs. <laughs> Summarizing instead of using our pizza, we could have used medication, but I thought the pizza would be much more yes. attractive. Right. We can look at this as medication and it's more it's more strong when you see the medication. So if, if, it, if these pills were all different exercises, you would think very, very carefully before you take one. Right. And I don't think we at that state of drama. OK, so the pizza is more lighter. If we have a little bit of this or a little bit of that, we don't have enough evidence to say that it's worse or bad. We have evidence to guide you what the baseline of the pizza has to be. Right. And then, of course, uh, hopefully with this talk, we can help you tomorrow when you get to the gym, as I said, think about, do I have this, this, this on my pizza? So that um, we, we hear, do this because I like this, this works for me or this, and you can make your own decisions. Remembering our key message. It's key to get things that actually address your, your issues. I mean, without doing that, I think, you know, you can do a lot of effort. If you look back to those Parkinson's Foundation guidelines and you try to follow those to a T, your new job would be just exercising all the time. So you need to find things that target your specific issues. We believe that using dual task exercise is a good way to achieve that. And so for the next couple of months, we've designed different classes that we're going to do each week in order to be able to integrate the dual task with different activities. So you can get a mm -hmm. chance to try it and see which ones make the most sense and which exercises you like at the same time. Yeah, so just giving you, we will start next week with doing a session regarding specifically the dual task itself with different activities, yes. with the, the movements that we might know. You know, taking the benefit of technology means that why not use this because most therapists will have a challenge to have these cognitive things when they do it in person with you. Yeah. Because our brain can only do so much. <laughs> it's kind of like having Lumosity so, built in with our class. Yeah, we would show you more, but hopefully you will join us yeah. and you will try it out. And, and then different ones. Yeah, let's we'll just go through each one. For the second week, we're going to do a more focus, voice focused one. This is cognition and communication. And we were talking about that as being a separate pizza. So this will have a lot of the cognitive load with more of a focus on communication. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw some of the Zumba. Josefa is brilliant at that. You're going to love that class. A dual task boxing. We're going to do a virtual boxing program. That'll be on the 6th. Um, we do have a one week break at the very end of the of March, so you'll see that show up on the schedule, but we start at the very beginning of April, which is Parkinson's Awareness Month with boxing. Um, this is an unusual program that I put together. It's a seated and standing Pilates. Pilates is kind of a bodywork program, and I actually got my training in Colorado, and I'm going to focus it really on communication, because one thing that I think Pilates really does a good job of is improving posture and breath, and that both of those come into play with, with communication. And then yeah. we'll also have a singing, a, a, a basically a virtual choir. I, I have a background in music, and I'm going to be applying that here. Actually, again, some of the most interesting research for, for music uh, came from neurologic music therapy up in the University of uh, or Colorado State University with Michael Tao. So drawing from all that, we'll use it. It has great tools for Parkinson's. And then we'll close the whole program out uh, actually with uh, a training program that takes advantage of emerging technology, speech recognition. We'll do it real time. It'll be exercises, but at the end, you'll actually be able to use those tools on your phone and your computer better, but it'll actually be a class. So we're going to, we're kind of breaking to the new ground with that. And I would say that these will just be like we did with the dance now, just practical example about how can we add in things. But above all, it's it's uh, training these examples so that you can use it with whatever you you're doing in terms of exercise. So it's that's cool. it's we want to give you a tool that you can use to assess what you're doing. I guess we have just a couple minutes. If anyone had any questions, we've been watching them in in the chat. Uh, this video will be available on the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies YouTube channel. Um, couldn't get the uh, the captions working today, but I'll go into the back end and make sure we use them a lot. And I actually use, um, I actually, oh, thanks, thanks, Marjane. Um, I actually use speech recognition in real time in our classes for that last program. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, someone's asking about our, uh, balance issues. There are ways to modify. When we see people show up in class and we have your cameras on, 
we make those modifications in real time so we can make it work. But I, I think the question specifically is like, what exercise options do we have oh, to balance? Sure, that's hard. And so what I would say, it's like, uh, first we look at what the person is doing. And if you, if imagine you're already doing something that, that is already focusing on your balance, right? The best evidence we have is balance training that would require you going to a therapist. But any of these activities, the dance, the boxing, they all usually challenge you when your balance moving while you're doing that. So great results of balance with dance. Mm -hmm. The boxing also has shown results on that. And but if you really want to focus on on the balance, um, you probably want to seek specific help on that. I don't think this would be we ever have a lecture. If someone says, "What if I just don't like to exercise?" If we didn't have someone say that, That's, then. That's my type of, of people that I deal with. Come to Portugal. <laughs> uh, they have great coffee here. And uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be well. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I tend to create exercises, make, if, even if the person, there has to be something that you like to do. Walk. Yeah. There has to. So it's like brainstorming. It, it really requires us to really get to know the person and understand what motive. Maybe it's gardening. So can we integrate something in the gardening, which is already some activity? And I think when we really hate to exercise, it, it takes longer, but I think integrating small boosts of exercise throughout the, the day, sitting and standing, I usually call it like sitting and standing 12 times on your couch is the exercise of shame. <laughs> so you do that, at least that, I, I like beg people to do it. It's just that one. I just ask you 12 times. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is possible, uh, believe me. Commercials come up there. Someone's asking about uh, the best aquatic exercise. I wish we could do that virtually. Josepha is amazing at that. I've, I've been in so many programs with that. Yeah, so aquatic is one of my greatest passion. I think it's that type of exercise that is completely that is complete. It's a beautiful pizza. Uh, the challenges that people have is dressing and undressing. It really consumes a lot of time. But you know, if, if it's things that are meaningful to you, it's also good to train it. So mm -hmm. I think getting dressed and undressed, as long as the safety and the efficacy is guaranteed, um, it's um, I would say any inside the water. I would, there's like this. I wouldn't say there's wrong exercises or anything. We want to always focus on the most affected side. So even if you do like hydrogenastics with the general class and they're doing all these exercises, you probably want to focus on your most affected side. That's how I would adapt it, right? It's like even if it's not a Parkinson specific class, I can have this conversation with the instructor and say, I have Parkinson. I want. I probably when you do both hands, I'm going to do more my most affected side. Yeah. Most people are usually nice about that, so it's... Um, I'm being it's mindful possible. of the time, guys. I'm looking at this here. Um, we're going to be here for the next two months. So every Thursday at 1230 Mountain Standard Time will be a different class. Uh, if you've signed up here for this lecture, you will get the reminder email on that Thursday. And next month, uh, next month, next Thursday, next week, we start with the dual task for Parkinson's that combines movement and voice and cognition. So it'll be a cognitive workout and we'll be getting you sweaty and we'll be using your voices. And we'll be able to answer some of these questions along the way. I just want to be respectful of everyone's time and especially the people at the Parkinson's Associates, the Rockies. Jody mm -hmm. Brown, the executive director, thank you, Jody, for giving us the opportunity to work with your people. I, I moved to Colorado in 2005 and it changed my way of looking at the world and I, I always love coming back. It's really a, it's a wonderful part of the country. Um, Portugal is a lot different. But it's, a nice, <laughs> it's a nice marriage. It, no, it's really very different over here. The European culture is, is crazy. But uh, we're really looking forward to the program. Uh, we'll get this video up online for anyone who couldn't watch it all the way through or share it with your friends and, and we'll see you folks next week. Thank all you. Right. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, everyone.